Bye. Good morning, and welcome to the Macy's, Inc. third quarter 2021 earnings conference call. Today's hour-long conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to Mike McGuire, Head of, head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us to discuss our third quarter 2021 results. With me on the call are Jeff Gannett, our Chairman and CEO, and Adrian Mitchell, our CFO. Jeff and Adrian have prepared remarks that they'll share, after which we'll provide time for questions. Given the time constraints and the number of participants, we ask that you please limit your questions to one. Along with our press release, we've posted a slide presentation on the investor section of our website, Macy'sInc.com. In addition to information from our prepared remarks, the presentation includes additional facts and figures to assist your analysis of Macy's. Also note that given the pandemic's impact on 2020 results, unless otherwise noted, the comparisons that we'll speak to this morning will be versus 2019, as we feel that benchmarks our performance more appropriately. We noted in our press release this morning that on Thursday, December 2nd at 8 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time, Adrian will be participating in a fireside chat at the Morgan Stanley Virtual Global Consumer and Retail Conference. This event will be webcast on our investor relations website, so please mark your calendars. Keep in mind that all forward-looking statements are subject to the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from the expectations and assumptions mentioned today. A detailed discussion of these factors and uncertainties is contained in our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. In discussing the results of our operations, we will be providing certain non-GAAP financial measures. You can find additional information regarding these non-GAAP financial measures, as well as others used in our earnings release and our presentation on the investor section of our website. And as a reminder, today's call is being webcast on our website. A replay will be available approximately two hours after the conclusion of this call, and it will be archived on our website for one year. With that, I'll turn the call over to Jeff. Thanks, Mike, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Our company delivered another strong quarter and exceeded our expectations on both top and bottom lines, outperforming 2020 and notably 2019. With strong cash generation year to date, we were able to execute on our capital allocation priorities, including returning capital to shareholders. Our business has demonstrated resilience, and we remain confident in our ability to deliver on the Polaris strategy. And as a result, we are raising and narrowing our full year 2021 guidance. Our 21 results demonstrate the progress we've made with our Polaris strategy, operating in a better economic environment, as well as the strength of our digitally led omnichannel model. We are poised for sustainable and profitable growth and will continue to build and invest in our retail ecosystem to both maximize and accelerate our opportunities. Today, I am pleased to announce that we are making a significant investment to launch a curated digital marketplace platform to enhance the existing Macy's Inc. business, fuel customer acquisition, and drive growth across all of our channels. We will partner with the enterprise marketplace technology company, Miracle, to build the platform. Through this new digital marketplace platform, which will launch in the second half of 2022, we will connect carefully selected third-party sellers with our customers in a scalable way and provide even greater breadth of assortment of exciting products to deliver on our promise of style and curation. Our digital business is on track to generate $10 billion in sales by 2023, and that figure does not include the incremental revenue we expect this new marketplace platform to generate for Macy's Inc. Now I'll provide some highlights from the third quarter. Comparable owned plus licensed sales increased 8.7%, an improvement in trend from the 5.9% increase we saw in Q2, even after adjusting for changes in our marketing calendar. Adjusted diluted EPS was $1.23, up significantly from Q3 2019 and adjusted EBITDA was more than two times better than 2019. Gross margin for the quarter improved by approximately 100 basis points, driven by stronger regular price selling, fewer markdowns due to leaner inventories, and a number of pricing and promotion initiatives, and offset by increased delivery expenses. 
Gross margins and inventory are benefiting from the outstanding work that our supply chain teams have done in navigating the recent disruptions. When they first began in the fourth quarter of 2020, our teams activated plans to mitigate bottlenecks and since then stayed agile and flexible, leveraging our strong networks and relationships with international carriers and brands, and diversifying how we move product both up and downstream. Significantly, as a result, we don't expect to be materially impacted by supply chain issues during the critical holiday shopping season. Total company AUR was up more than 12% across our three nameplates. SG&A dollars were significantly lower, driven by a combination of ongoing expense discipline and unfilled open positions. Looking at each of our nameplates, comparable sales for Macy's brand were up 8.4% on an own plus license basis, which represents a nearly one point improvement versus last quarter when you take into consideration the friends and family marketing shift. Macy's brand full price sell through improved 610 basis points, while full price AURs increased by 6.9%, driven by high demand and our gross margin initiatives. Our Bloomingdale's business performed well with comp sales on an own plus license basis up 11.2%, which was in line with the second quarter. Results were driven by strong sales of luxury handbags, fine jewelry, home, men's shoes, and contemporary apparel and both stores and Bloomingdale's.com outperformed 2019. Blue Mercury continues to recover, outperforming versus 2020, but was down 2.2% compared to the third quarter of 2019. We see strong sales performance in private brands, home fragrance, and treatment. Turning to the health of our customer base, we brought in 4.4 million new customers into the Macy's brand, a 28% increase compared to 2019. Approximately 30% of these new customers were dormant customers over the last 12 months who have now re-engaged. In addition to growth in new customers, customer loyalty has also increased. Star Rewards program members now make up nearly 70% of the total Macy's brand comparable own plus license sales, up approximately 10 percentage points compared to 2019. During the quarter, we saw platinum, gold, and silver customers re-engage with average customer spend in these tiers up 16% compared to the third quarter of 2019. Bronze members, who represent our youngest and most diverse loyalty tier, continue to grow with the addition of 2.3 million members during the quarter, and we're seeing average spend per customer increase 13%. Bronze is one of our best customer acquisition vehicles, with approximately 35% of members under the age of 40 and 57% ethnically diverse. Our Star Rewards loyalty customers have a more personalized and productive shopping experience with the most relevant offer presented to them, right down to the particular homepage they see. This is leading to increased conversion, higher revenue per visit, and a decreased rate of customers leaving the site. And through targeted personalization and pricing science, we've been able to reduce the number of broad-based promotional days and increase AURs. Having a strong integrated retail ecosystem that provides a seamless shopping journey enables us to successfully attract and retain our most productive omnichannel customers. The growth of our omnichannel ecosystem is powered by our thriving online business, relevant full line brick and mortar stores and growing off mall format stores, all soon to be further accelerated by the new digital marketplace platform. Our data validates that in markets where we have a physical presence, our online business is stronger. The interplay between our digital and physical assets is more important than ever, and we are focused on establishing an appropriate footprint in markets that drive our sustainable and profitable omnichannel growth. Turning to merchandising, which we think about in three buckets. First, our products and categories that were strong during the height of the pandemic, such as fragrance, watches, jewelry, sleepwear, and home, continue to perform well during the third quarter. Second, occasion-based categories such as dresses and men's tailored and luggage are continuing to see renewed interest from our customers. We're able to meet their shifting demand thanks to our wide range of assortment. And third, our emerging categories and new brands are expected to drive sustainable and profitable growth in the future. These complement our core categories while satisfying the customer shopping journey, and we're seeing encouraging results. To give you an example, 
Since bringing the Toys R Us business to Macy's.com in August, our toy sales have more than doubled in stores and online compared to 2019. And we continue to expand on our assortment in these emerging categories. During the quarter, we added another important new brand partner, Fanatics, which offers our customers the largest selection of licensed sports products and increases our fan apparel offering 20-fold. This expanded assortment drove a 22% AUR increase in sports apparel and headgear compared to 2019. Using data and analytics, we continue to grow key brand partnerships with more vendors looking to us for expanded relationships. One element of this is the B2B monetization of our advertising partnerships that we realize through our in-house media agency, Macy's Media Network, which continues to generate solid results and recently expanded its scope to include Bloomingdale's. We see a lot of potential to further strengthen our relationships with vendor partners and cultivate even greater customer engagement. Overall, through Polaris, we laid a solid foundation for digital growth, and we're seeing that growth come to fruition. We are now able to focus on additional strategic investments to refresh the digital experiences to create more experiential customer engagements, enhance our stores, and further empower our colleagues who drive the success of our business on every level. Our important digital initiatives during the quarter included a refresh of Macy's mobile app, the launch of live shopping at both Macy's and Bloomingdale's, and a fragrance finder. We also rolled out our 3D room planning expansion, added PayPal and Venmo to in-store and online payments, and launched a sustainability product cyclist. As a result of these and other investments, digital conversion for the quarter was 4.25%, up 14% compared to the third quarter of 2020, and up 27% compared to the third quarter of 2019. Turning from digital to stores, we also continue to invest in our brick-and-mortar business and are seeing ongoing trend improvement in store conversion. During the quarter, sales in our non-downtown locations continued to sequentially improve. But due to the slow return of international tourism and office workers, our downtown doors continue to significantly lag our other doors versus 2019. A good example of stores recovery is our backstage store within store format, with sales up 24 percentage points compared to full line stores. Backstage store customers are more diverse, with 56 percent of customers ethnically diverse and have a higher spend. Across our ecosystem, everything we do starts with and is driven by our colleagues. They are our most significant contributors to our success, and we are pleased with the strength of our performance this year has made it possible for us to double down on our investment in talent. Last week, we announced a plan to launch a best-in-class benefit program to give our colleagues access to debt-free education. We are also raising our minimum wage rate to $15 an hour, which will be in effect nationally by May of 2022. This will increase our average total pay for hourly colleagues to about $20 an hour. Our workplace culture and colleague engagement have never been stronger, and we see it as a meaningful competitive advantage in this tight labor market. Adrian will now summarize the financial details before I make brief closing remarks. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. As Jeff shared, our third quarter results demonstrate the strength and momentum of our digitally-led omni-channel Polaris strategy. Top-line sales continue to grow, gross margin continue to expand, SG&A continue to gain leverage, and as a result, we delivered EBITDA and EPS far above our expectations. Additionally, we continue to successfully execute on our capital allocation priorities aimed at strengthening our balance sheet and returning capital to shareholders. Our strong results, combined with our continued confidence as we move into the holiday season, are leading us to narrow and raise our full year 2021 guidance, which I will expand upon in a few moments. Now, as I do each quarter in summarizing our results, I'll focus on the metrics that are most important to value creation, sales, gross margin, inventory productivity, expense management, and capital allocation. First, for the second quarter in a row, we have generated top-line sales above 2019 levels. In the quarter, net sales increased by $267 million 
or 5.2%, to $5.4 billion, while we posted comparable own plus license sales of 8.7%. Keep in mind that compared to 2019, October benefited from the pull forward of some sales from the fourth quarter into the third quarter. The early start of our friends and family sale in late October contributed to this, adding about 200 basis points to the own plus license sales comp. Additionally, holiday shopping began earlier as it did last year, but we won't know the full extent of the pull forward until we get further into the season. Nevertheless, even when adjusted for friends and family, we produced solid sales growth and continued to expand our trend of sequential improvement. Now, I want to take a moment to highlight the progress we've made as a true omnichannel retailer as we have become increasingly focused on the sustainability of omnichannel sales growth. The true performance and potential of our omnichannel performance is hidden when sales outcomes are viewed as digital results versus brick and mortar results. Recall that Jeff said we see stronger digital sales in those markets where we have physical stores. And we certainly saw this to be the case in the third quarter. Moreover, while digital sales continue to grow and store sales trends continue to improve, notably more than 70% of our omnichannel market saw overall sales growth over and above 2019 levels, which represented approximately 85% of Macy's brand comparable owned plus license sales. So digital isn't merely benefiting from a shift of sales from stores, it is actually growing beyond that. In our presentation, you'll see several examples of these growing omnichannel markets. Within these markets, there is an added potential to expand our market share further with the addition of new off-mall locations. During the quarter, we opened five new locations in the Washington, D.C., Dallas, and Atlanta markets. We've seen a strong sales response and solid net promoter scores from customers well above our planned expectations. We are very encouraged by the initial results, and we now see a clearer path to new store off-mall growth. So through a combination of physical stores in the best malls, the most productive off-mall locations, and a best-in-class e-commerce platform, our sales growth is accelerating as we meet customers whenever, wherever, and however they choose to shop. In addition, an omnichannel view has also highlighted the need for us to take a second look at the timing of when we close the approximately 60 remaining stores we previously planned to close as part of Polaris. Those markets that are performing best in aggregate include many of the stores previously slated for closure. With this in mind, we're considering the following points as we approach the optimization of our store portfolio. First, as it relates to underperforming mall-based stores, delaying closure of certain stores allows us to maintain a physical presence in the market, which is critical to our top-line growth. Second, these stores are cash flow positive and support the funding of investments needed to reposition our store portfolio over time. And lastly, we're adapting our learning in these smaller off-mall formats to more quickly introduce these concepts to more markets with plans to open more of these stores next year. Scaling our off-mall formats will allow us to reposition our brick-and-mortar assets within markets to more effectively support omnichannel sales growth. As a result, we expect to announce about 10 closures in January, with more details on the remaining stores to come later in 2022. Moving on to gross margin, we saw another quarter of rate expansion to 41%, an increase of 100 basis points compared to the third quarter of 2019. We continue to generate very healthy merchandise margins, which improved by 270 basis points to 45.3%. The primary drivers were the consistent improvement we maintain in lower markdown and inventory productivity, which I'll expand upon shortly. Markdown levels were the result of a combination of lower inventory levels, and further scaling of pricing signs, including location-level pricing and POS pricing work. And as Jeff noted, these efforts drove higher full-price sell-throughs and full-price AURs compared to 2019. We continue to roll out additional initiatives, including a new promotional effectiveness tool 
given our team's access to advanced analytics to better understand the profitability of prior promotional events. The improvement in merchandise margin was offset by a rise in delivery expense due to increased digital penetration. Delivery expense was 4.2% of net sales, 170 basis points higher than the third quarter of 2019. Even though the increase in merchandise margin more than offset the increase in delivery expense, the mitigation and reduction of this expense is a top priority for us, and we have plans for cost savings in this area, which we've outlined in the presentation. With regards to inventory productivity, inventory levels were down 15.4% compared to the third quarter of 2019, a product of ongoing market dynamics and our own Polaris initiatives. Our sales to stock ratio remains healthy, and the improved use of data science continues to enhance our inventory management practices from order placement all the way to customer sales. Inventory churn for the trailing 12 months improved by nearly 18%, while for the trailing six months, inventory churn improved by approximately 22%. Additionally, given the macro challenges facing the retail industry, we're staying ahead by making further shifts in our inventory management practices and implementing a number of initiatives. As we noted on our last call, we do not anticipate improvements to many of the macro supply chain constraints until mid to late 2022. Moving on, we again exercise strong expense management discipline, our net value creation metric. SG&A expenses of $2 billion improved by about 10% or $229 million from the third quarter of 2019 levels. As a percent of net sales, SG&A expenses were 36.3%, a significant improvement of 630 basis points compared to the third quarter of 2019, as we continue to benefit from permanent cost savings and reduced costs due to elevated job openings. The impacts of the labor shortages are transitory and we expect them to moderate going into the next quarter as well as into the next year. Improved bad debt levels driven by strong customer credit health continued to contribute to the growth of credit card revenues to $213 million, up $30 million from the third quarter of 2019 and ahead of what we expected. Credit card revenues were also ahead as a percent of net sales, increasing by 40 basis points to 3.9%, and trending ahead of our prior annual guidance. As it relates to our credit card program, we are close to finalizing our decision on a partner and expect to announce the decision in the upcoming weeks. As a digitally-led retailer, we must have a partner with strong digital capabilities today and a strong innovation pipeline with the prospect to further expand that pipeline in the future. Our loyalty and personalization initiatives serve as key growth levers in our ability to obtain and retain more customers to drive omnichannel sales growth. That said, over the next few years, we expect credit card revenue levels will be slightly lower at the percent of sales than the 3% or so that we have historically experienced. Given our strong performance across these areas, as well as the $50 million of asset sale gains recognized during the third quarter, we generated positive adjusted EBITDA of $765 million. Notably, adjusted EBITDA margin of 14.1% exceeded the margin in the third quarter of 2019 by 708 basis points on the strength of expense management discipline and gross margin expansion. After accounting for interest and taxes, collectively, these results helped to generate quarterly adjusted net income of $386 million and adjusted diluted EPS of $1.23 versus $21 million and seven cents respectively in 2019. Our final value creator is capital allocation and our meaningful free cash flow generation of $574 million year to date has served us well in this regard. In the third quarter, we repaid approximately $1.6 billion of debt early, which brings our leverage ratio well under our year-end target. And while we drew on our credit facility to support the build of seasonal merchandise during the quarter, we did so at a much lower interest rate than that of the debt we retired. Going forward, we expect to use the facility periodically based on the needs of the business. Now, 
we successfully regained an investment grade profile well ahead of schedule. We will continue to pay down debt as debt matures with an aim to achieve a leverage ratio below two times in the upcoming years. Additionally, we paid $46 million in cash dividends and announced our fourth quarter dividend earlier this month. And we repurchased 13 million shares, or more than 4% of total shares outstanding, for a total share buyback of $300 million. With $200 million of authorization remaining, we plan to look for further opportunities to repurchase shares. These actions underscore our confidence in our business and our commitment to our capital allocation priorities that create shareholder value in the near term and the long term. Turning to our outlook, as mentioned, we are narrowing and raising our full year guidance. We have strong momentum entering the fourth quarter, but the headwinds that we noted on the last quarter's call remain in play. The supply chain constraints, the tight labor market, elevated levels of holiday shipping surcharges, and potential unforeseen impacts of COVID variants. The low end of our guidance considers the impacts of these headwinds. You can refer to our slide presentation for the complete fourth quarter and full year guidance metrics, but here are some of the highlights. For the full year, we now expect net sales to be between $24.1 billion and $24.3 billion, which at the midpoint of the range is an increase of over $400 million from our prior guidance. We narrowed and increased our adjusted EPS range to $4.57 to $4.76 from $3.41 to $3.75, an increase of more than a dollar compared to our prior guidance. Now for the fourth quarter, comparable sales on an own plus license basis versus 2019 are expected to increase between 2% and 4%. This includes an approximately 125 basis point adverse impact due to the shift of the friends and family promotional events from the fourth quarter into the third quarter as compared to 2019. Gross margin rate expectations are between 100 and 150 basis points lower than 2019. SGNA expense as a percent of sales is expected to improve by approximately 75 basis points compared to 2019. An adjusted diluted EPS is expected to be between $1.67 and $1.87, excluding the impact of any additional share repurchases other than those already executed in the third quarter. Our progress to date, combined with our Polaris initiatives already underway, put us well on the path to profitable and sustainable sales growth. As such, we have increased clarity on our business outlook over the next few years. In 2022, we see several incremental tailwinds for our business beyond those from our Polaris initiatives. The consumer is healthy, and we expect the strong demand to continue, particularly as people return to work. As borders open, we anticipate an uptick in tourism, although we don't yet see tourism returning back to 2019 levels in 2022. At the same time, we're keeping a watchful eye on headwinds. As mentioned, we are actively managing supply chain disruptions with success. We're continuing to navigate the labor shortages and competition for talent by investing in our current and future colleagues. We are also focused on mitigating inflationary pressures on our customers by leveraging our pricing science while continuing to provide our customers with clear value. In summary, our team is committed to accelerating and sustaining top and bottom line growth through the continued successful execution of our digitally-led omni-channel Polaris strategy, which in turn will strengthen the health of our balance sheet and deliver strong returns to our shareholders. Next quarter, we look forward to sharing with you further detail on our guidance for 2022 and our outlook for 2023 and beyond. With that, I'll turn the call back over to Jeff for some closing remarks. Thanks, Adrian. So in summary, we remain focused on executing our Polaris strategy to position Macy's Inc. for sustainable and profitable growth. We regularly review the structure of our business and our strategy and are open to all options that are likely to create long-term shareholder value. This past year, we conducted an analysis of our e-commerce and brick-and-mortar operations 
evaluating how each contribute to the value of the company, as well as how each benefits from being integrated and working together. In collaboration with our board and with assistance from our advisors, we looked at multiple business models that would create long-term shareholder value while always respecting the omnichannel behavior of the customer. This work supported our digitally-led omnichannel Polaris strategy that we are successfully executing. That said, we also recognize the significant value the market is assigning to pure e-commerce businesses. And as we look at the landscape today, we are undertaking additional analysis that could help inform our long-term strategy to further unlock value for Macy's Inc. To help in these efforts, we have recently engaged Alex Partners to work with our board and financial advisors. It is too early to tell what the results of this additional analysis will be, but we plan to update everyone after the work is complete. Before we take your questions, I want to express my gratitude to the entire Macy's Inc. team for delivering another quarter of strong results. I am confident that we have a lot more opportunity ahead. Our colleagues focus on both strengthening the fundamentals of our business and driving innovation. Give me great confidence that a bolder and brighter future for Macy's Inc. lies ahead. So thank you everyone. And operator, please begin the Q&A. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, that is star 1 to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone an opportunity to signal. <clears throat> Our first question comes from Chuck Brom with Gordon Haskett. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, congrats on a great quarter. Um, Adrian, just I wanted to ask about your gross margin levels. Um, they're going to be approaching um, 39% this year, which is really impressive. Um, how, how should we think about that line item going forward? Do you think you can maintain it given some of the Polaris efforts? And then more specifically, um, on slide six, you call out the $76 million benefit from the local, local pricing and POS pricing work, where are we on that journey? Is there still um, a, lot, a lot left you can, you can gain from that? Thank you. Good morning, Chuck, and thanks very much for your question. Um, you know, we're very pleased with the gross margin performance that we've seen, and I think it really speaks to just the traction that we continue to have with regards to our collateral strategy. Um, as we've spoken about before, we're using a lot of data science to inform how we're, how we're actually thinking about inventory allocation, how we're thinking about our pricing and promotion activities. And so we feel really good about the progress that we're making, and we do believe that as we continue to scale those initiatives, we'll certainly have additional opportunities as we move forward. You know, when I think about the $76 million that you're referencing, you know, my perspective on that is that there's just continued progress that we're making with regards to our pricing and gross margin efforts. And so you, you actually, look, when you look at our overall gross margin performance year to date and in the quarter, it's really just a reflection of that. And so we'll continue to lean into those initiatives and make sure that we continue to improve our margin position, both on the gross margin rate side as well as on the merchandising margin side over time. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. Our next question comes from Matthew Boss with J.P. Morgan. Great, thanks. Congrats on another nice quarter. So, so Jeff, with three Q comps further improving from the second quarter, how do you feel about the health of your customer base in the holiday, maybe based on what you've seen in November? And then with supply chain disruption lasting into next year, as Adrian cited, do you see AUR gains as sustainable in the fr front half of the year? And is tourism a potential second half of the year opportunity in your view? So on the health of the customer, hi, Matt. Um, on the health of the customer, uh, we definitely see that continuing. So when you look at um, the amount of active customers with us versus 2019, you look at the AOV, you look at the AUR, um, and you look at just their, just their, the, their spend overall, um, all of those metrics are improving. So, you know, we hark back to looking at the active customers and how they're responding both online and as well as in our stores, uh, check that box, uh, improvements there. And then when you just look at the new customers that are coming in, yeah. to have 
another 4 million, 4.4 million coming in. Uh, some of those are re-engaged, but the bulk of those are new to our brand and to see their spend metrics. Um, as, you, as we've talked about in the past, we always track uh, a new customer and how they shop with us the quarter and then the quarter after that. We're getting about 20% of, of new customers that are always shopping in the next quarter and another 20% in the quarter after that. So that, that is, that's consistent with what we're saying. So um, as it relates to kind of supply chain, um, you know, we really, we're in good shape right now. Um, you know, obviously we want the inventory to be below where we were in 2019. When you look at our inventory level versus 2020 to be up about 19%. That kind of syncs with our mid-20s uh, uh, volume that we're guiding in terms of fourth quarter sales above 2020. So we're in good shape with that. We certainly have pockets that, are, that remain tough, uh, but you know, we're mitigating those by all the things that, you, that we've talked about in the past. So that continues. I mean, we expect the supply chain issues are going to continue into uh, 2022. Um, some categories are much better. Some categories persist. But I think overall, we've got a great handle on how we're mitigating that through all of our tactics. You know, as it relates to kind of tourism, um, you know, we have not yet seen a change really in international tourism. So you know that that's about three to four points of total comp for Macy's and Bloomingdale's. That is going to be a tailwind for us. We do expect that part of that to come back in 2022, not fully to 2019 levels, uh, but that will go into 23 as well. So um, when you look at our downtown stores, they're still struggling. Our suburban stores are, are performing much better. When that tourism comes back and when office workers come back with, uh, with higher percentages, we do expect those downtown stores to, uh, to really be benefited. It's great color. Best of luck. Thank you, Matt. Our next question comes from Kimberly Greenberger with Morgan Stanley. Great, thank you so much for taking the question. Jeff, I was very interested about your comments uh, on the, the kind of um, importance of both the digital and the physical assets. It sounds like you did um, a good deal of work here over the past year to understand uh, the interplay between these two channels. I'm wondering uh, if there are any sort of key data points you could share with us uh, from that work. It sounds uh, obviously very interesting. And then secondarily, um, the uh, reassessing the store closures um, that, you, that you all talked about, I'm wondering what are, um, as, as you wind the clock forward, let's say a year from now, what are you looking for those stores to produce that would give you the all clear signal that you uh, should and want to keep them open? And is, do you, do you maintain your optionality on those stores that you choose to keep open? Uh, do you have um, the option, a, option to close them at some future date should the financial performance change? Thanks so much. Really, thanks for your questions. I'm going to take the interplay and the omnichannel behavior of our customer, and then I'll have Adrian uh, take the store closure question. Uh, so, absolutely, we um, I think any retail brand right now is, is 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 reaping the full benefit with the right investments in the omnichannel customer. And uh, clearly, what we've seen over the years has been just increased activity that's going on between the app, between the website, and store behavior. And so those touch points now is on an average transaction for an omnichannel customers now around six different touch points before a purchase is consummated. And uh, versus where it used to be five years ago was in the two range. So uh, clearly the more, uh, the more the customer is, is engaging with omnichannel, the more they like it, and that's a reinforcing loop. So, um, you know, we, we see huge interplay going on. Research is generally starting on app. Most of our digital business now, the majority of it is now coming on via the app. Uh, a much bigger chunk of transactions are going on there via app, but a lot of that behavior is while they're in a store. And you just, from research, from pre-purchase, you know, discovery, to purchase, to post-purchase engagement, and then, of course, what we're doing with uh, all of our data and analytics and personalization to reach out and see that behavior is where this is going. So it's just getting to be a tighter and tighter loop 
um, and we fully respect the, the omnichannel behavior, um, and we're, we're making the, the appropriate investments to ensure that it's a frictionless experience uh, for him and her. So um, that's, that's where that's going. Um, it certainly you know, begs where we're, we are going with the, our, our, our entire market strategy. So the idea that the interplay that goes on with brick and mortar that's on mall, as well as testing out new off mall formats, um, that is played out in the free markets that uh, we said it would. Uh, we're, we're digesting all of those new openings that Adrian talked about in his comments. And uh, we'll talk on, on our next call about what that looks like for our expansion of that in 2022. Um, but that loop is, is, is increasing. And what we're seeing is that the more brick and mortar business uh, or that we're creating, the more the digital is, is happening in those particular zip codes. So um, we'll give you more color on that when we, when we speak next. Adrian, why don't you take on uh, store closures? Thank you, Jeff. Kimberly, good morning to you. Um, very good question as it relates to store closures, but let me start by giving a little bit of context. So as we've mentioned early, earlier, um, you know, we spent about a year really trying to understand what the future footprint of our business will look like. And part of that is really for us to focus on creating a growing and profitable omnichannel ecosystem that is really a combination of our existing best malls, our off-mall stores, overlaid with our digital experience. Now, as we think about omnichannel growth, you know, we're very much focused on the fact that digital performance is stronger in the markets where we have stores. And as we shared on the call, our omnichannel performance is actually very critical to have both the digital footprint as well as the stores footprint. So there are kind of three things that we've really been thinking through as we are moving forward with regards to store closures. The first is that delaying the closure of certain stores really allows us to maintain that physical presence. And that physical presence allows us to grow omnichannel sales, which is one of the reasons why we want to share some of the progress we're making in omnichannel sales recovery relative to 2019. The second thing is that all of the deferred mall-based stores are actually cash flow positive. So this becomes the funding mechanism for investments as we reposition that portfolio that we're working towards over the next several years. And then the third piece is we're continuing to learn and adapt our off-mall format. We're very pleased with the early results that we're seeing with this version 2.0 of our Market by Macy's, Bloomingdale, small off-mall locations. And so we feel really good about the progress that we're making there. But ultimately, we're constantly reviewing all of these store locations. You know, we're you know, expecting to announce 10 closures at the beginning of next year. And ultimately, how many we close and on what timetable continues to be a work in progress, but we'll continue to be very transparent on the pace of those closures as we progress. Very clear and helpful. Thank you both. Thank you. Our next question comes from Paul Legway with Citigroup. Thanks. It's Tracy Kogan filling in for Paul. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about what you're seeing on the inflation side, both um, in the cost to you and then how um, – talk about your strategy, I guess, and how you're presenting that to consumers on the pricing side. Thank you. Hi, hey, Tracy. Um, so obviously we've been through these inflationary cycles before, and, uh, and when you look at it, you have to kind of make some generalizations about cost increases. In some cases in fashion, we can pass that on, uh, but commodities are a, are a different story. Now, thankfully, and I'm talking like shorts, tanks, tees, commodities that, uh, that we and, and our competitors all compete with, um, in that, thankfully, uh, a, a chunk of those commodity businesses really done through our private brands, and we've worked, <coughs> excuse me, we've worked really closely with our, our overseas suppliers and our sourcing capability to really help mitigate rising costs. Um, as you would expect, we have we're very focused on testing and our pricing science. So all the way through this uh, third quarter, we've we've had over 400 AD POS pricing tests of where customers will accept cost increases and where they won't. And, and we're making all adjustments in, in, in future tickets as well as promotion based on that. We also have, when, when you think about uh, what, what the Macy's and Bloomingdale's brands have been doing over the years, we, we have really changed the historical practice of overlapping discounts. So the value that we're offering customers is much clearer, and that gives you higher AUR. And we're looking at that in market share events versus one-day sales uh, versus weekend events. So we're getting higher AURs just because of the clarity of our prices. Um, the big solve for us is, is, is two things. One is 
we're really committed to maintaining leaner inventories and ensuring that those inventories are being allocated to the right portal for where we expect omnichannel behavior. And then the second big thing is the big tools we're doing through data and analytics and automation, which is our opportunity to mitigate price increases when they come. And that would be personalized POS messaging, which we'll do through our personalization, as well as um, the, the science that we're deploying against the discrete hard markets. So we're our opportunity to now take a price decrease on a permanent basis at a store or channel level and doing that at a level that we've never been able to accomplish before, that's going to help us with whatever price increases we might put into the ticket. So, um, you know, we feel like we've got uh, really good science and good history and experience on inflation, and uh, we will react as it comes. Great. Thanks very much. Our next question comes from Stephanie Wissink with Jeffries. Hi, good morning. It's Blake on for Steph. Thanks for taking our questions. I was wondering on your digital marketplace, um, how many SKUs and which categories are you targeting? wonder if you could provide any commentary there. And then how should we think about this impacting your Macy's uh, media network business? Uh, hi, Blake. So um, the, the, the details of your question we're not ready to answer yet. So uh, we will be giving you more detail on this as we launch it. But a couple of headlines uh, is that when you think about this, we have a very successful digital business now. And uh, the marketplace announcement that we made today was the next, next natural step in our evolution as a, as a digitally led omnichannel retailer. So just to ground, we, we put down the marker on a couple of earnings calls ago that we were going to hit $10 billion by 23. We are very committed to that. Um, marketplace would be on top of that. Um, and what we found in just everything we've done to develop our digital business was really the customer behavior and the categories that they were requesting, the new brands that they were requesting, and what was the best way for us to, 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 uh, to, to capitalize on that. So we've been doing that through OWN or through BDF. And the opportunity now was for us to look at getting uh, achieving some of that through a marketplace platform. So as, as you would expect, we studied all the types that are out there. Being the number two website in our categories in the nation, we have a lot of competition in some of the other really strong players, and all of them have marketplaces. So our ability to be able to study you know, how they do it, what the competitive landscape is, how this is going to align against the player's strategy, what are the risks, what is the financial opportunity, ensuring that we had a scalable model that really minimized our investment and incremental cost on this for both Bloomingdale's and Macy's is, is what led us to our partnership with Miracle, which we think is best in class. So we're deep at work with them. We're standing up our discrete marketplace team within our digital uh, um, uh, pyramid, and we will be ready for a launch in the second half of 22. We believe that the customer benefits of this is curated assortment, because that is a must. It needs to be curated as a fashion and style uh, you know, retailer. It needs to be a seamless experience for the customer. And then, of course, the business benefits are we know that we can grow digital, our business faster. We can generate more profitability. We can get more depth and breadth of assortment and really, uh, you know, address new brands and emerging trends for a customer who looks to us uh, to be able to do that. That's great, Cole. I really appreciate it. Last one for me. Um, I think last quarter you had said you were going to test a few stores um, with various fulfillment initiatives, including some automation and ship from store. I was wondering if you had any update on that so far, or maybe you could speak more broadly to uh, just getting, you know, more customers comfortable um, picking up from store uh, as well, in addition to, to delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, Blake. With regards to the fulfillment operation, we'll share a lot more detail about the success of that as we get into our next earnings call, our Q4 earnings call, what I would say is that we're very pleased with the progress that we've seen thus far. And the true test will really come when we hit our full peak season going through the holidays in terms of really pressure testing the technology, but so far so good with the robotics, with the investments that we've made in space, as well as with the productivity that we've seen as we're ramping up. As we think about pickup and store, we want to be able to have a flexible fulfillment operation that gives the customer choice. There are going to be moments in time where the customer will pick up from store. There are going to be moments in time where we'll be shipping to his or her home. I think what we're very much focused on is really bringing, that, bringing down the delivery expense 
while also increasing speed for the customer. And so as we begin to think about our downstream fulfillment capabilities in stores and continuing to expand that beyond where we are today, in addition to the automation and other investments we're making upstream, uh, we feel that we'll be able to both bring down our delivery expense as well as increase the speed for the customer. So we're just really focusing on a flexible operating structure that allows the customer to have real choice in however he or she wants to shop. Our next question will come from Oliver Chen with Cowan & Company. Hi, Jeff and Adrian. Congrats on a great quarter. Um, we, we upgraded the stock on a lot of the digital agility you're seeing and, and conducting. Jeff, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, as you look at value creation and, and the uh, undervaluation of the digital business, what might be key criteria or, or things or a scenario of, of possibilities or a framework um, for the next stage of, of that kind of analysis? And then I'd also love your views as we approach Black Friday and holiday. Uh, what are some highlights? Uh, this, you know, this will be a season like no other uh, in terms of uh, what's most different or, or uh, strategies that you will be focused on this time versus others. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, Oliver. Let me take the first question. So, um, look, our focus is to ensure the omnichannel behavior of customers is going to be respected at all costs. I think the omnichannel behavior is irrefutable, um, and we need to respect that. Um, but we're looking at a range of things, including the net of cost, benefits, and execution that's associated with operating as a one integrated business versus operating at two separate businesses. And, you know, you know, ultimately, we just need to see that the additional shareholder value can be unlocked beyond the potential of our current approach with our digitally-led omnichannel flare strategy. So we're working with our board and our advisors for some time on this. But based on how the market is, is, is assigning value to e-commerce businesses, we just added Alex Partners, which we announced this morning, as an objective third-party firm to really pressure test all of our analyses. And so we're in the middle of that work. We need to complete our analysis, and we plan to provide an update after the work is complete. Um, as it relates to Black Friday, I think they hit it. Um, it's going to be like none other. Uh, what is it going to be like versus a 2019 versus what it was in 2020? What we saw in 2020 was the pull forward of demand, um, and clearly we prepared for that again. You saw that in uh, what we did with the moving of the friends and family event into October, um, as, as a, a, to just stated now, October was our best month of our third quarter, even when you take out uh, the friends and family shift. Uh, November has started out, has started out strong. Um, but what that means, I mean, obviously, the amount of business that we do from Thanksgiving, Cyber Week, going into the holiday, all that's in front of us. So we're prepared. Uh, we are closed on Thanksgiving Day, which is a big change from where we were in 2019. But we expect our digital business to, to uh, obviously track very strongly all the way through now and, and the holiday, um, as well as we are ready for all of the expected traffic that's going to start at 6 a.m. the day after Thanksgiving. So um, the values are very similar, you know, in, in the context of categories, but we are, we're ramping up on exclusive, on premium products, on, on products that customers have frankly been signaling all the way through the pandemic um, and since. And so we are ready on all of that content, and uh, I really like our stock position on all of that going uh, through the, you know, the Black Friday through holiday time frame. So uh, we're in good position, and we're going to be ready to, to adjust all of our strategies based on how the customer ultimately shops. We'll take our next question from William Reuter with Bank of America. Hi, uh, I just have one. Um, I think you took down your leverage target by half a turn to two turns this quarter from second quarter. I guess, uh, does this indicate any increased interest in trying to actually attain an investment grade rating? And I guess, would there be advantages to you of being uh, explicitly rated investment grade? That's it. Thanks. Good morning, and thanks very much for your question. So, you know, I would start by saying that we're just very pleased with the efforts that we've made to really delever our balance sheet, and we've been able to accomplish that well ahead of schedule. If you remember, as you remember, our previous target was to get under two and a half times. And so now that we've been able to achieve that, we're now saying, look, financial health and flexibility is really important for our business. And so we've now targeted ourselves to get below two times. 
So as we are in conversations with rating agencies, this is something that you know, we continue to feel really good about. But the additional thing I would point to is that we do also have the capacity to do all the other things that are really critical to the business. Investing in the business, continuing to take advantage of increasing our sustainable dividend every year over time, and also be purchasing shares. So I think you know, the leverage ratio target of below two times is all about financial health, about the business, and it gives us the capacity to be able to do a lot of the things that we need to do to continue to accelerate profitable growth, generate strong cash flows, and increase our return to shareholders. <clears throat> Our next question comes from Omar Saad with Evercore. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Great quarter. Um, a couple, a couple quick follow-ups. Um, you know, obviously, you guys are, are generating strong demand. Plus seven comps, X the shift. It sounds like October uh, was strong. November is, is off to a strong start. Um, but looking at the two to four guide for fourth quarter, is there anything you're, we're looking for in December, January timeframe? Uh, that might cause it's kind of that sort of deceleration that's implied by the guidance? Is there kind of inventory uh, in transit issues or other things that are going to cause the sales to decel there? And also, really quickly, um, you know, I know tourism and city center, that's a drag. The, the, those uh, downtown stores are a drag. Can you give us a sense, you know, at, at a high level at least, like what that plus seven might be like if, you, if the tourism and city center stores were back to normal? Thanks. Let me start, um, <clears throat> Omar, with the two to four. So when you think about the friends and family shift that it improved the third quarter trend by two points versus the 219 stack, it, it basically decreases the trend by about uh, 120 basis points in the fourth quarter. So take that, take that uh, comp of the uh, two to four to a, you know, a three two to a five two. When you look at that five two versus you know, what we've been for the other two quarters restated, it's in that ballpark. Um, what Adrian said in his comments would be that if you, we were on the lower end, it's because some of these external factors, more about, you know, COVID, more about if there's, if there's something that goes on, um, and I don't think it's going to be a supply chain issue that could affect our trend. So um, that's, that's where it's, it's basically comparable to where we've been running. Um, as it relates to kind of the, you know, what's going on with the downtown stores, um, we don't quote what the, how that three to four points in international tourism affects by location, but rest assured that, that there is a chunk of that that affects our downtown stores. As a meaningful in the downtown stores of international tourism is, is, the, is the dearth of office workers. So if you look at New York City alone, you got about 28% of the office workers that returned to office. That will grow into, we believe, the 60% range as you get into you know, the second quarter of 2022. That's obviously going to be a big boost to those downtown locations uh, that, serve, that are served by those customers. So you know, what I'd look at is just the total of three to four points. That's going to come into our trend at some point. It's going to be a tailwind. We don't expect to see all of that in 22, but 22, 23, that's going to be a plus for us. Our next question comes from Dana Telsey with Telsey Group. Good morning, everyone, and so nice to see the progress. Backstage, can you give an update on backstage, what you're seeing there in inventory? And then also on this small store format, I think that debuted in Washington, D.C., and it certainly feels like it's getting encouraging results. What is the opportunity there, and could that be square footage from existing stores that you may allocate to that for that format? Thank you. So Dana, let me take the backstage uh, question and then I'll throw it to Adrian to take the small door strategy. Um, so backstage had, a, had another great quarter and uh, this has been um, you know, just a, a complete growth curve for us. It's a profitable business. Um, what we see is it's mostly been in existing stores with very strong comps over any point of measurement, great sell throughs, the regular price sell-throughs just continue to climb uh, with each quarter in this business. Um, you heard us say in our, in our comments that backstage stores and stores were 24 points better than the balance of the stores of the same stores of measurement. Um, we continue to add new store within stores, and you saw in the quarter that we also added some freestanding, which joined the, the first iteration of freestanding stores that we added in 2015. 
So we're going to continue to do that. We've got uh, new stores on, 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 on the docket for 22, uh, a slate of new ones and store within stores, with like Herald Square being one of those. We're adding backstage in 22 in Herald Square, which is going to be a nice add. But then also new freestanding stores that we will add, again, into the ecosystem. Ecosystem for us would be the opportunity to have all omnichannel behavior, be it backstage or full line, that can go into any location. So the opportunity for returns or uh, buy online, ship to store, in the case of buy online, pick up and store, uh, backstage locations would have that for the full enterprise. So um, bullish on backstage. Good morning, Dan, and thank you for your question on off mall. You know, as I mentioned a bit earlier, we're just very encouraged with the initial results. And these off-mall locations really provide us with a, with a clearer path to new store off-mall growth, which we're just very pleased with. And that is within the context of how we're thinking about our ecosystem, our omnichannel ecosystem, which is a combination of the best malls, so how many of those malls have longevity, off-mall, which this gives us a clearer line of sight to, and then obviously the overplay with online and our mobile experience. So, you know, we opened five formats in Dallas, Atlanta, and D.C. We continue to see not just strong sales response, but also a very strong customer response as we see very elevated net promoter scores as well. But we're quickly learning. We're adapting. We will open and introduce more concepts, more of these concepts to more markets next year as we begin to kind of grow uh, this portfolio. But overall, what we're feeling good about is that there's just a clearer path for off-mall growth as we continue to work towards the optimal network omnichannel ecosystem for our business. Operator, we'll take two more questions. Our next question com comes from Bob Dribble with Guggenheim Securities. Hey, good, good morning. Um, I guess just uh, one quick question for me is, on the credit card renewal, can you talk a little bit about you know whether or not you think your terms will be better than the existing agreement? We'd just love to hear a little more color and update on you said that that's moving forward. Thanks. Good morning, Bob. Uh, you know we're very much in the final stages of a decision here um, with regards to our credit card RFP, and you know where we are right now is we're just a few weeks away where we'll be able to share more specifics about the program. And obviously, as we get into Q4 earnings, we'll be able to give much more details around where we are with the decision, what the impact will be on that program. But I think the key thing that we're very much focused on is ensuring that we're actually with a partner that has strong digital capabilities, a robust pipeline, and making sure that there's strong alignment and reinforcement of our, our digitally led omnichannel strategy. And the integration of our loyalty program, our credit card program, our Star Rewards program, our personalization program, and the credit card is a critical combination in terms of our growth for our business. So more to come. Our next question comes from Jay Soul with UBS. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff, I just want to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit on toys. It sounded like, you know, starting off – pretty promising, but you know, how big do you think that business can get? How impactful will it be to 4Q? And then my other question is about um, inventory coming in from vendors. I mean, do you anticipate canceling a lot of orders as we go through, you know, the year just be, because maybe, you know, you order a little bit extra just in case the supply chain is a little bit more challenging? If you could just really talk about how you feel about that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Hey, Jay. Um, so, Toy, it's, it's, uh, it's meeting our expectations, and uh, which is great news. Obviously, we had a um, you know, a, a, uh, when you look at our market share in toys, certainly opportunity. Toys R Us is at the moment we made the announcement, the digital business skyrocketed, and now you see it positioned in our stores. But the real uh, growth is going to be in 22 when we create um, substantially larger shops in 400 of our stores. Uh, we're working with all of our partners right now on all the content for that uh, and looking at exclusive content. We do believe we can be uh, the premier uh, brick and mortar destination for toys in America based on the, you know, the animation that we want to create, the experience we want to create, backed up with a, just a really robust website. So, uh, and as you know, toys, uh, the customer skews uh, to the millennial mom and dad. Uh, it's a younger customer. They've got a great profile. Uh, what we're seeing is the new customers are coming in in toys. A uh, higher proportion of new customers, and then our opportunity to personalize, you know, touch points with them after their purchase, 
uh, to be able to get and see the opportunities in other categories. So it's a great on-ramp customer for us. So, you know, very, uh, very happy uh, with, with how that is going. You know, <clears throat> um, as it relates to cancellations, Jay, to your second question, um, right now, obviously, we're working with, with, uh, with, our, with our vendors as well as our own private brands about what content that is. We think we've got, you know, all the mitigation that if you do have content that is on a boat right now that's going to miss Christmas, what do we do with that? Do we cancel it? Do we, do we hold it? Does the manufacturing partner hold it, you know, through a hoteling program, uh, you know, or do we, do we take it in depending on if it's a longer life? If it's got Christmas motif, you know, then that, that would be uh, something that we wouldn't take. But if it was something that had the life because it's a cold weather product, it might go into the first quarter. We're making all of those decisions with our manufacturing partners. So, you know, we are in constant communication with them, uh, and we've got a great strategy across all of our categories and all of our brands. And uh, I feel good that these are going to be win-win, uh, you know, decisions that we're making with all of our partners. Okay, I think that's uh, the end. I just wanted to say to everybody that um, I think the headline for us is that the Polaris strategy is working, that we had another strong quarter as a digitally led omnichannel retailer. Uh, we beat expectations both top and bottom lines, and that our 21 results just demonstrate the effective execution of Polaris and that we are positioned for long, sustainable, and profitable growth in the future. And we thank everybody for your interest in our brand and uh, have a great day. And that does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation. You